ask you a question. Can a student still bring their Bible to a public school in America and pray while they are on campus? Can you bring your Bible with you into the secular workplace? Today, we will be answering these questions as we interview attorney Brent Olson. Brent works with the Alliance Defense Group to preserve our Christian heritage as a nation. I invite you to join me now. Thank you for joining us for this edition of the Good News Radio Broadcast with Pastor Tom Arnold. Tom serves as pastor of Good News Church in Yukon, Oklahoma, and is our teacher on this daily program. It is his desire that you will discover God's abundant plan for every aspect of your life through the faithful study of God's Word. Join us now as we go into today's message. Well, we want to welcome you to today's broadcast, the Good News Church radio broadcast, and we have a special guest with us here today that I can say is a friend of mine, somebody that I love and respect. I'm actually 10 days older than Brent, and so I always remind him that I am his elder by 10 days. And That's right, and I have to respect my elder. There you go. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you're here today, Brent, and wow, America has gone through a, a lot of battles this year. I'm thinking of all the changes that have taken place in America. And Brent, if you weren't on yesterday's broadcast, Brent is an attorney in Oklahoma City. He graduated undergraduate degree from ORU. And then after that, he got his doctorate degree at TU. Right. Mm -hmm. And then he practices law in Oklahoma City and has for many years. And uh, his office is right in the heart of Oklahoma City, a couple of blocks away from the Murrah bombing memorial, a couple of blocks mm-hmm. away from where the thunder plays. Exactly. We are in the heart. I'm with the Cheek Law Firm. Yes. We are at 311 North Harvey in downtown Oklahoma City, but we also have an office in Tulsa. Oh, there you go. Because being a Tulsa guy, I like to get back to my hometown yes. as well. So our office is there off of I-44 and 41st Street. Well, Brent is a, uh, he's an advocate for Christians. He is a representative in the body of Christ, when people have honest questions that relate to legal issues. We live in a time, I think, where kids are afraid to pray over their lunch at school, in, in public schools. Address that real quick. So can can a, okay. can a child pray over their meal at school? They can certainly pray over their lunch at school, particularly lunchtime is free time. And I think that's the standard that you go by, that uh, you know, kids can bring their Bibles to school, they can pray. It's, it's during the time when everyone else has free time that they can do with it whatever they want. The main prohibition is you don't want to disrupt a class. Class time is class time. But, for instance, uh, the uh, Meet You at the Pole movement, when you go pray at the, at the flagpole, absolutely they can pray. They can take their Bible. They can share and talk about their faith to fellow students. Look, if, if other students are going to talk about the ball game or this, that, and the other thing, you can certainly talk about Christ. So what about in the workplace? I mean, I work at a place, and mm. I'm, I'm just using a hypothetical mm-hmm. here. I'm, right. a, I'm a kind of a remnant person. I'm, there's not right. very many believers at, here. At the workplace, you can take your Bible. Again, same sort of principle. If, if they're talking about the sports game or the TV show or anything like that, you can share your faith. The main thing is, though, you got to be able to work. It's, it, but you can bring up your faith just like everybody else other topics at, at work around the water cooler, so to speak. Uh, you, if an employer can't tell you, for instance, will you have to take off, say, your cross that you wear, or some sort. If, if okay. they're allowing everybody else to do that, so. The, but the advice I give is to to be a good employee, but. Uh, you don't have to compromise your faith, but make sure you get your work done and right. be excellent at right. it too. They didn't hire you necessarily to be a chaplain. Exactly. You're so. not a chaplain, <laughs> but uh, you're there to be work hard, but you can also share your faith right. too. But you are a chaplain in the sense that you're going to let your light shine. And many times exactly. people, they in, it's invariably people will come and be drawn to people of faith, of Christian faith. Whenever they mm-hmm. go through a crisis, they have a Absolutely. Way of- and here's the thing. Employers, they can tell the real thing from the fake. Yeah. You know, things don't always go our way in the workplace. Right. No matter where you are and how you react to it. Are you going to react Holy Spirit, Spirit led or are you going to let the flesh kick up there? Right. So that's the other challenge and, and also the opportunity to be light. 
So a couple of weeks ago, Brent is in Washington, D.C. He's on a business mm-hmm. trip, but he took a little excursion for a few days. And Sharon and I have recently been to Washington, D.C. and about three years ago, but when we were there. And, of course, one of the things that just struck me as you're going through mm-hmm. the Capitol, for example, is that if something ever happened to our U.S. Capitol and they were to ever rebuild it, so much of the artwork that is there and so many of the monuments – so many of the plaques, the scripture references. Unfortunately, I think in today's culture, they would try to scrub that and try to just cleanse it from the scripture, which is so crazy. So what are some things that stick out to you as you think about Washington, D.C. and just our Christian heritage? When I was down there, I was just for a limited period of time, and I got to walk the Lincoln Memorial. And just in my spirit, I've been praying, Lord, send a great awakening, yeah. not only to Washington, D.C., but send leaders that will be spirit-led and will have backbone and courage to stand by Christian beliefs and, and principles, and would also send a great awakening to your church overall in this nation that we would be the light yeah. that our, to the nations that our founding fathers wanted us to be. That That's significant. And, and That's kind of been the springboard why I I guess I've enjoyed American history so much through my my life. I didn't realize just, you know, being uh, studying history and all of a sudden it's become a passion. And now it's almost become a necessity because so much with the curriculum and all, they want to scrub the religious Christian influence and principles in the founding of this country, pretend like it never happened. And we cannot keep the glue. You cannot have a free nation with the liberties that we have if we throw God out. It's, it's, it is incompatible. Yeah. I think a lot of Americans were really blessed whenever they saw when the prime minister of Great Britain at Easter, whenever he made that speech to his nation, and he said, we are a Christian nation. And he talked about, yes, we include, yes, we welcome other people of other faiths, but make no mistake about it, we are a Christian nation. And and I say that because I think in our culture today, people want to say, well, we're people of faith. But, you know, it's not just faith, but specifically it is Christian faith. It is absolutely Christian faith. There is a very important person in Washington that has made some suggestions that their Islamic influence at the founding, again, that was just historically didn't happen. Right. The reason why that we have liberty in America like that of not known at any point in time was because Christian people settled this nation. They understood what the Bible's principles were, and they were able to make a bridge from those principles and put it in a what we call a secular government to where it was not, you know, some minister or priest or a theocracy right. as commonly charged. They put it in a secular where anyone could be an American, but they understood the principles that came directly from the Bible. We, the, we, John Locke is cited, for instance, as a major influence to help Thomas Jefferson write the Declaration of Independence, that you know men are entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those came from John Locke, but John Locke was a profound Christian. Right. When you drill down in these influences, it comes back a strong Christian Bible belief where they got these ideas. Well, and I think even I was talking to my son, my Mm thirteen-year-old son. I think it was just yesterday or two days Mm -hmm. ago, and we were talking together, and I was mentioning how even the Declaration of Independence itself, endowed by their Creator. Exactly. In today's culture, would we even use that vocabulary because they'd be mm-hmm. so afraid that they're going to inf- interfere with somebody who happens mm-hmm. to believe we're in evolution rather than creation? Thomas Jefferson wrote in his notes on Virginia where he was explaining, said that, no, our rights are not secure if we remove from the consciousness of the people that they are a gift from God. Yes. He understood that rights came from God. Because what is the other counter-influence? People want to elevate the state above the church or religious beliefs. And once you say the state gives rights to people, then the state can also take it away as well. As far as 
the U.S. People, I think people want to know, mm-hmm. what can I do? And, of course, I tell them as a pastor, obviously, 1 Timothy 2 tells us that first thing we need mm-hmm. to pray about is not just for ourselves or for our own immediate family, and, and certainly that's included in what we need to be praying about. But the Bible says, first of all, pray for kings and for all who are in authority. Why? That we could live a quiet, quiet and peaceable, peaceable life. life. And I think a lot of what we're seeing right now in America is anything but a quiet and peaceable yeah. life. We have more conflict. Mm-hmm. We have more hostility going on. There's and it's, it's up to us. So much more turmoil. And we understand that we as Christians, if we believe in the power of prayer, that puts a lot of responsibility upon us. If, certainly if we read Ezekiel about where we are supposed to be watchmen on the wall, and if we do not give the message or stand up for the principles or what God's Word is, then suddenly we're responsible for what happens. If, right. you know, that's paraphrasing Ezekiel. But yes, we must pray. The other thing is because we have this liberty to choose our leaders, right. that makes Christians all the more responsible to make sure they are educated as to yeah. what's going on, Certainly. to make good reason decisions about how to vote and who to vote for and try to influence and find the right people to live in public office because it's difficult in public life to go up and actually execute what you've told the voters to do. That requires not only outward courage, it requires spiritual strength. I know one man that was a huge influence in both of our lives was Kenneth E. Hagan. Mm-hmm. And uh, obviously your grandmother had a chance. Gene Wilkerson knew him very personally and I know you had a chance to interview him before he passed away when you were writing the book about your grandmother's life, Contact with God. One of the things that Brother Hagen shares about an encounter he had with the Lord was he told, it was during the Nixon years, okay, during the Watergate, mm-hmm. all the chaos that went on during that period of time, not limited to Watergate, but other mm-hmm. things that had gone on. And one of the things that Jesus, the head of the church, told Brother Hagen in a vision was, I'm going to hold the body of Christ accountable for a lot of the things that have gone on because if the church had been praying as they should have been praying, a lot of the things that happened in America wouldn't have happened. And so when I hear that, and when I'm reminded of that, it's in a book entitled The Art of Prayer. Mm -hmm. And I know our ladies at the church are going through that book right now. But it's just a tremendous reminder. Now, we're going to pick up again on tomorrow's program and talk a little bit about the role of prayer and the role of being salt and light. And so, Brent, I just want you to know I love you. I admire you. Mm -hmm. I respect you. And I believe that you're certainly called of God to serve in this role. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thanks for joining me for today's program. I trust you enjoyed the interview with attorney Brent Olson. Now more than ever, Christians are called to be salt and light in our nation. God's plan for America is found in 2 Chronicles 7.14, which reads, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Thank you for listening to today's message. You can hear this message again by visiting online at goodnewschurch.tv. To listen to this and many other messages by Pastor Tom, download the Good News Church mobile device app by searching for Good News Church Yukon through both the iTunes and Android stores. Through the website, you can also subscribe to the podcast. Pastor Tom invites you to visit Good News Church whenever you are in the greater Oklahoma City area. Good News is located at the intersection of Main Street and the Yukon Parkway in Yukon. He welcomes you to worship with them on Sundays at 10 a.m. Good News Church, it's a great place to be.